Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Donc, c'est en tant que rédacteur en chef de la revue Photonique que l'on m'a confié le soin euh, d'animer cette première session de la semaine. Euh, tout d'abord, j'aimerais vous, vous dire le plaisir que je ressens d'être aujourd'hui avec vous. Euh, c'est juste incroyable de voir cet amphi. Euh, j'aimerais remercier, et j'en profite pour remercier toutes les personnes impliquées, elles sont nombreuses euh, dans l'organisation de ce colloque et elles nous permettent de vivre ces moments-là. Euh, donc la revue photonique, bien sûr, ne pouvait louper euh, cette semaine, ce colloque. Donc euh, je vous invite vraiment à aller euh, rencontrer euh, une partie de l'équipe euh, qui va animer le stand de la revue, Annie et Elisa. Donc n'hésitez pas. Euh, n'hésitez pas également à aller rencontrer les personnes du comité de rédaction. Il y en a, certains membres seront présents euh, cette semaine-là. J'espère également avoir l'occasion d'interagir avec vous euh, tout au long de cette semaine au sujet de la photonique, de la revue. Euh, donc si vous avez des suggestions, des idées, des retours à nous faire, c'est l'occasion. Donc euh, nous sommes là pour, pour cela. Donc encore une fois, euh, n'hésitez pas à venir euh, nous voir. Donc euh, Annie, Elisa sur le stand, les membres du comité de rédaction qui seront présents, ou bien euh, moi en tant que rédacteur en chef. Donc je me tourne euh, désormais vers euh, le premier orateur euh, de, cette, euh, de ce colloque, première conférence plénière, donc euh, le professeur Philippe Russell. Donc, euh, le professeur Philippe Russell, euh, donc, tout d'abord, il parle et comprend très bien le français. Donc, c'est la raison pour laquelle, avec son accord, je vais faire cette présentation en français. C'est donc, euh, comme vous le savez, Optique, euh, Optique Nice est un colloque francophone. Alors, quelques mots, tout d'abord, pour présenter le, le parcours incroyable et contribution exceptionnelle de Philippe Russell à, à l'Optique. Donc, comment, comment procéder tout d'abord, on peut dire qu'il a obtenu son PhD à l'Université d'Oxford en 1979. La suite de son parcours est marquée par vraiment une très grande mobilité géographique. Alors, on peut citer notamment un séjour à Hambourg en Allemagne, puis un séjour en France, avant d'effectuer un séjour aux états unis puis de retourner à Southampton en Angleterre. Et je vous laisse deviner la ville qu'il a choisie en France pour effectuer son séjour. Et vous l'aurez deviné, il s'agissait bien évidemment de Nice, ville dans laquelle il a passé une année, entre 84 et 85. Donc euh, en 1996, euh, Philippe Rosset s'est installé euh, à l'université de Basse pour fonder et diriger le groupe de photonique et des matériaux photoniques. Euh, il a passé 9 ans, 9 années euh, vraiment exceptionnelles en termes de productivité scientifique, euh, euh, voilà, avant de partir, donc de retourner en Allemagne en 2005. Alors cette fois-ci à Erlangen pour rejoindre le Max Planck Institute of Light. Alors ces travaux pionniers ont fortement et durablement impacté la communauté scientifique et je dirais même la, la société dans son ensemble, tant les fibres optiques microstructurées sont présentes dans de nombreux secteurs euh, d'activité. Alors bien sûr, ces euh, contributions exceptionnelles à ce domaine lui ont valu de très nombreux prix. Euh, impossible de les lister euh, aujourd'hui, de les annoncer tous, tellement ils sont nombreux. On peut citer notamment quand même le prix Fraunhofer Burley de l'Optical Society of America en 2000, en 2000 euh, le prix euh, Thomas Young en 2004 de l'IOP, et plus récemment le Future Prize euh, remis en 2014. Euh, sachez également que Philippe Russell est fellow de la Royal Society, de l'Optica Society of America, que l'on nomme euh, aujourd'hui Optica, et qu'il a, a donc cette société savante qu'il a présidée en 2015. Donc euh, on le comprend aujourd'hui, c'est un véritable honneur que l'on a, et c'est vraiment, euh, nous sommes privilégiés, je pense, de pouvoir accueillir aujourd'hui en présentiel euh, le professeur Philippe Russell pour cette première conférence euh, plénière euh, dans cette ville de Nice qui lui est chère. Je vous présente, donc je vous demande d'accueillir le professeur Philippe Russell. Merci bien. Je suis désolé que je ne peux pas parler le français. Uh, I, I don't have any practice. But it's a real delight to be back in Nice. Um, it's almost 40 years since I was here. I came and I worked in the group of uh, Laboratoire d'Electro-Optique with Dan Ostrowski. And one of the people I worked most closely with was Mark Dimitri, so it was very nice to hear the homage to him earlier today. Um, he and I published a paper, actually, um, uh, back from those times on lithium nibate. Um, he also invited me, Mark Dimitri invited me to Nice in 2014, so it's not so long ago since I was last here. <laughs> uh, 
So I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference for inviting me. It really is a huge honor to be the first speaker at a conference like this with so many young people, so many people in the audience that I know. I'm, I can't see you all, but it's really good to be here. Um, let me see if I get my things to work here. Is it still working? Yeah, very good. Um, so uh, I wasn't really quite sure what to exactly to talk about because so much has happened in this field of photonic crystal fibers um, over the last three decades. It's actually a little more than three decades. So I thought I'd split this talk into two. Uh, the first half, first 20 minutes, I hope so, so will be about the story and some of the science um, over the last um, 31 years or so. <clears throat> um, so let me see if the click works. Yep. Just ignore those. I couldn't resist putting those in. I don't know why exactly. Um, <laughs> but that's the PCF structure, you see. And we've been building it for 30 years. But I just before I actually start, uh, and, uh, I've, had to, I've been forced to retire in Germany. I didn't want to, but they force you to. So I've recently become director of a new institute in, in Hongzhou in China. So if anybody fancies a few years in China, just send me an email. <laughs> So, photonic crystal fibers, well, I'm sure many of you know what these are, um, but uh, there may be some of you who, who are not so familiar. Uh, this is a gallery of the main types. Um, the first type that we worked on was the solid core variety. All these fibers have a, an array of hollow channels running along their entire length. Um, it's a, typically a periodic uh, array of hollow channels. Um, and if you design things correctly, you can guide light using a two-dimensional photonic band gap, there's an structure like this, but then more recently there's been a lot of excitement about these, this new kind of fiber, which I'm going to talk about a little bit, um, uh, which guide by anti-resonant reflection, so it's not actually a photonic band gap effect. And one of the leaders in this field is Feder Ben Abbey, which many of you know in Limoges in France. In fact, a lot of the work in photonic crystal fibers has been done in France, so it's really nice to be here. Okay, so uh, some little history here. Now, this is, this is going to be very lightweight. Uh, it's, it's more of a history than, than about the science. So where did the idea come from? Some of you may ask. Well, obviously, it came from optical fibers. I had the fortune to have worked both on periodic structures and on optical fibers. And if you go back uh, to the 19th century, uh, sadly, this guy, Daniel Colladon, he, uh, he actually did the first experiment and reported uh, guidance of light in a, in a, in a stream of, of water. But John, John Tyndall, who was uh, much better at communicating science, uh, became the one who was well known for it. So obviously, you all know what a step index fiber is. It has a core with a slightly higher refractive index. As a result, you can have rays of light bouncing to and fro inside the core um, at a shallow angle because total internal reflection keeps the light trapped. And only at certain angles do you form a mode, of course. And you know this very well. Um, the idea for doing this goes back a long way to 1966. This is Charles Cow. He looks like, I don't know, like he's about 14 years old in that photograph. I always think he looks so young. Uh, but he was the first to propose that these could be used, that this uh, type of structure could be used in telecommunications. The other idea that I have been working on myself uh, in periodic structures and, and diffraction of light and block waves and photonic band structure before it was called photonic band structure was obviously photonic crystals. Um, and there are many examples of photonic crystals. Uh, this, this beautiful, um, uh, this beautiful, I don't know, that was, that was very slow, this beautiful beetle being an example. Um, but one of, the most, one of the most beautiful examples of Bragg diffraction, which is the other, th the other component of photonic crystal fibers, is, 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 is this, as I say, this Bragg, Bragg scattering mechanism. This is an Ethiopian opal turning uh, under illumination with white light. And of course, in the opal itself, there are close packed lattices of nanoscale silica spheres. And if you get the angle right and, you, and, the, and so on, and the color, the wavelength of the light right, you get strong uh, reflection. And of course, you all know about Bragg scattering. Um, yeah. So let's just have a look at this. The Bragg angle goes back a long way again. This is, again, very basic physics. You all know this. You send, uh, send a beam of light into a periodic structure at a certain angle. You get a very strong cumulative reflection. And this was pointed out by the Bragg father and son. I think it's the only Nobel Prize won by a father and son. It's quite, a, quite unique. <laughs> It's a very precisely defined condition, as they pointed out uh, way back uh, 100 years ago. <clears throat> but the, what's interesting is that if the reflection from each Bragg plane is, is, very, is very strong, then the Bragg angle becomes uncertain. So you can get a very strong reflection 
over a, a very large angle. And if that angle is, great, is, is such that, that if we superimpose three of these things and this, this angle is greater than 120 degrees, then you have a, 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 a situation where the light is unable to penetrate into the structure. And if you can also make sure to, Im to, to suppress any internal modes that there may, may be in that material of space, then you will have created a two-dimensional photonic band gap material. Uh, of course, Eli Ivanovich suggested you could do this in three dimensions, which is a revolutionary idea. But even the two-dimensional idea is revolutionary. I mean, not many of you can th were, well, some of you were around uh, when these ideas were being proposed first. But to move from a very simple stop band, which everybody understood, to the idea that you could suppress light completely in two dimensions was truly revolutionary. So it breaks my heart to hear people talk about stop bands as being photonic band gaps because it just doesn't capture the excitement back, uh, back at the end of the 1980s. Okay, so the idea was to put these two things together. Could we create a photonic crystal cladding with a two-dimensional photonic band gap? And if we did that, you might send some red light in uh, at a certain angle and the light would not be guided. The light would be leaky. You might send some blue light in, different angle. Again, it's leaky. But if you happen to hit the magic condition where the angle is, is such that, and the wavelength is such that you hit this two-dimensional photonic band gap, you'll be able to keep light trapped in a hollow core. You'd be able to prevent the diffraction of light in vacuum, essentially, which is, uh, I, to me, the, the, the most um, groundbreaking, if you like, seminal thing that we did was to prove that you could do this, to overturn diffraction in vacuum. <coughs> Okay, well that was one thing to have the idea, and the idea goes back, I think as it's, you can see on the last slide, to 1991. Um, I, to be honest, I wanted a piece of the action. I was so excited by this photonic band gap idea <laughs> of Eli Yablonovich, um, uh, and I knew about per periodic structures, and I was kicking myself for not having thought of photonic band gaps, but there you are. So I wanted a piece of the action, but I knew about optical fibers, so it, it was natural to put them together. But, but having had the idea, it was far from clear way back at the beginning that you could actually get a two-dimensional photonic band gap using only glass and air because the refractive index contrast is, is not very high. So we had to do some calculations on this. Um, and we did, in fact, uh, discover that it's possible. Let me just explain the diagram. This is frequency and this is wave vector. Classic propagation diagram for, uh, for a, a structure. Um, and these are all the different materials. This is air or vacuum. This is the, uh, the si this is the silica only, the green line, and the photonic crystal fiber cladding would, would have a, an effective index somewhere in between. But what we wanted to find was a bit of a hum actually. What we wanted to find was I'll move over a bit. What we wanted to find was are there any photonic band gaps that sit on the left hand side of the, this 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 vacuum or this, this air line? Because there we'd be in a position where propagation is allowed in all regions of the structure, including the hollow core, but it's unable to propagate in the photonic crystal fiber cladding. So, so you've switched off the ability of light to exist um, in, in that region, and therefore you can trap light in a hollow core, form a mode in a hollow core. So, uh, but, okay, fine. So we proved, <laughs> the first thing we did was, we, the computers just were just about good enough to do that calculation back then, unless you could get access to a supercomputer. <laughs> Uh, so we proved that it, it existed, but then we had to make it. So how could you make it? And uh, in this kind of, I'm sure many of you have tried things for the first time, and there's nothing in the literature about it. You don't know how to do it. You, you just haven't a clue. So you try lots of different things. But taking the first step is the most difficult. And having taken the first step and succeeded, then of course it's easier to make the next step. The first thing that didn't work was with the help of a, a laboratory technician from, from Warsaw, which we called Kaz, I could never pronounce his second name. Um, uh, he tried drilling holes in a stub of silica glass, uh, but the drill kept breaking, and we just kind of gave up, um, although the idea was there. And then we finally came up with the now well-known uh, process of stacking and drawing, where we start with a, 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 a whole stack of, of capillaries, this is about a centimeter or one or two centimeters in diameter where they draw this down uh, by a factor of 10 in linear dimension to a cane and then draw it down again to the actual optical fiber. So we get 100 times uh, l reduction in linear dimension. So we can make very small structures this way. 
Actually, this idea, this, this technique, uh, was not something that we, uh, uh, we were not the first to, to try making fibers in this way. If you go back to 1974 at Bell Labs, uh, they were working with stacking capillaries and drawing it down in a very simple structure in order to create guiding cores at the interstitial uh, points between these membranes. So this kind of had been done before, but, but they did not have the idea of creating a photonic band gap back then, of course. So, well, we succeeded in finding a technique for making these things, and then, of course, serendipity, as it quite often does, stepped in and uh, played a role. So in looking for a photonic band gap, which is really what I, we wanted to see, we find something else. Um, and this was guidance, and in a way, looking back, it's so obvious, but <laughs> when we first saw it, it was far from obvious. Um, Jonathan Knight and Tim Burks were my team, um, and I remember Jaren Zilberberg, who sadly is no longer with us, saying that we had a dream team uh, in Bath, um, and the dream team were these two guys, really, really incredible colleagues, very creative. Um, but uh, they made the very first fiber, and the very first one didn't have any deliberate core. We did have some accidental defects in the structure, and so we, he, the Jonathan, who did the experiment, noticed that there was some evidence of guidance. You could call that light localization, if you like, but actually it's something rather simpler, I think. So then he went back into the lab and made another fiber with a deliberate core, and we saw the very first, um, first uh, uh, guidance um, at a deliberately filled in hollow channel. So, so this, is, this is the photonic crystal fiber core, and then this led to one of the first papers. Um, and actually, uh, a, 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 a kind of guidance which <coughs> I like to view as modal, modal uh, filtering or a sieve, you know, sort of to something that, that sieves out the small things and traps the large things. So if you look at, a, look at this fiber, which has quite small hollow channels, there's a core in the center, um, it turns out that the fundamental mode, which is big, it, it's, it, can't, it can't kind of sneak between the hollow channels. The hollow channels are strong barriers. So this mode is trapped. It's, it's, it can't squeeze between the air holes. If you like, its resolution limit is, is, is the way, the effective wavelength is too big. But the higher order modes are able to leak away. So, um, so we have a, a fiber which is, and this was Tim Burks's coinage actually. He, he, he came up with the name endlessly single mode because we could not find any wavelength where the fiber guided a higher order mode. And of course, this was because of this filtering, this filtering effect. So there was a lot of excitement, as, uh, and I'd never experienced this before, to be honest. But we got a lot of interest, a lot of people getting in touch, a lot of journalists, and so on. We were very fortunate in actually being donated a drawing tower, a very simple drawing tower by British Telecom back then. This was a three-legged tower that had been used in the 1970s for some of the early work on optical fibers. Um, and uh, yeah, this is the tower we did most in the University of Bath, where we did a lot of the initial uh, experiments. It was actually intended for the science museum, this tower, and it's still being used in Bath. Um, and the New Scientist magazine got interested and did a feature article, and, and uh, the guy who came to take the, take the photographs, you've got to watch out for these journalists, you know. They, they, he, he saw a whole pile of plastic tubing, and he thought he wanted to put that over the, over the tower because it looked better somehow. So. He draped, he draped the tower, all, the, the, this tubing all over the drawing tower, and there was me sitting beside it looking like an idiot. Um, it got even worse, actually, because when the, the article was published, when the article was published, this was the picture he chose. I wanted Tim Burks and Jonathan Knight to be there, but there was just me with these stupid tubes. And then not long afterwards, I came upon this far side cartoon by Gary Larson. Uh, and I, I liked it. This is the angry R. These are hornets. You know, these are the journalists. They're waiting for you. And there, there's Russell. I, you see, it's even got my name. So Russell outside. So <laughs> anyway, so uh, <laughs> that's a little bit of the early history of how this, how this field started. Um, we had a huge amount of fun back at the University of Bath um, in, in, the, in, the, um, in the late 1990s. And these are just some of the pictures from the papers uh, that we saw. We saw different photonic band gap effects. We saw all kinds of things. Uh, so it was a huge amount of fun. And that's the first part of my talk. Let me look at the time. Not doing too badly. If you just give me a second, I'll get the... OK, now we're going to switch to something serious. Um, I've chosen, because there is limited time, of course, and I don't want to keep you for ages, um, 
I've chosen basically two topics out of all the different things we've been doing. Um, and these are some of the most recent results that came out of my work at the Max Planck Institute in Erlangen. Um, and the first one is a topic that I really love um, because it, it came out through a kind of serendipity again. Um, uh, and it's, it's optomechanical high harmonic mode locking of a fiber laser. Uh, and uh, this is just an introduction. It's published in these papers if you're interested in reading about it. There's several papers uh, on this field. But the idea is, or well, the idea was, way back at the beginning, which goes back to 2013, that's the first publication on this, um, was to make use of the optomechanical response of a photonic crystal fiber core. This is a solid glass core, uh, which is very isolated from its surroundings because there are very large hollow channels around it. And that, of course, can, can support uh, high frequency resonances. So we'd have a gain, uh, EDFA for some gain. We have a searchable absorber. It's a classic uh, mode lock laser. And if, if, the, if you have a train of pulses, and the pulses are the repetition rate is such that it drives the, the, the resonance in the core resonantly, then we can get high harmonic mode locking. Um, so this would be a typical experiment. These pulses are less than a picosecond in duration. They, 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 they drive the, uh, the resonance in the core and create a coherence wave. I like to view this as a coherence wave um, of, of resonances in the core. And, and you get a kind of uh, virtual circle where the, 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 acoustic, uh, the acoustic vibrations act back on the light and, and so on. Let me just explain a bit more about this. Um, so why, why does this work? Why does each pulse in this train sit stably at the same position in each time slot here? You know, how can that be? It doesn't seem to make any sense. It's a very weak, this is a very weak acoustic wave. Um, let's think about it a little bit. Well, it turns out to, f to, to zero order, at least, you can get stabilization of the pulse frequency by kind of surfing the wave. The pulses are actually surfing this refractive index wave. So the, the, the refractive index in the core of the PCF is like this. And this is relative time. So this is traveling along. So the acoustic wave is traveling at the same speed as the light. You're going to say that's an acoustic wave. It can't do that. Well, it's a coherence wave. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a regular acoustic wave. It's different. Its group velocity is very close to, to, to zero, but its phase velocity can be very high. So anyway, so the pulse is riding on a, a wave, refractive index surf, a sur wave. It's surfing on the wave here. And underneath, the refractive index is changing positively. And this gives you a redshift in the frequency of the pulse. But it's, the pulses are always going through, also, also going through an EDFA, <coughs> where the, the EDFA gain is higher at, at high frequency. And this will give you a, a relative blue shift, so the, the pulse will tend to shift to the blue. And these two, these two processes cancel and, and keep the pulse at a stable position. But there's another, uh, another effect here as well. You get retiming forces that control any pulse jitter that there might be. Some, so the pulse ends up in the wrong place. Something has to push it back to, be, to, to where it should be. So if this is, this is the point where the gain-related blue shift balances the optoacoustic redshift. So that, that's the stable point. This is the relative position. This is the acoustic wavefront. Uh, let's suppose, for some reason, the pulse falls back to here. Then it finds itself on a, a point where the slope of the refractive index is less. So we get, um, we get a, a, a frequency um, up. The frequency increases because the redshift is weaker. So the frequency goes up, and the group velocity, of course, goes up as well because of the anomalous dispersion. So it gets pushed back. And if it, if it goes, if it drifts forward, the pulse, then the slope gets higher, the redshift is higher, and, and the pulse gets pushed back. So we, we have an automatic stabilization of the pulse position. Um, so you can imagine the pulse banging to and fro, but always being pushed back by this effect. Of course, this happens throughout many, many, many round trips in the laser that, that it, it, it it stabilizes itself. Um, OK, so, so in, in, you can view this then as, as a kind of potential well within which each pulse is trapped. So let's just, so it, in, in fact, you can, you can mode, high harmonic mode lock a fiber laser with extremely good stability. This is an example of, uh, in this optical paper, of uh, 83 femtosecond pulses 
at 1.9 gigahertz or so uh, using one of the acoustic core resonance. So it works very well, it's very stable. Now this, this has been around for some years. I wanted to talk about some very recent results on this. Um, but before I get to that point, just let, let me just make one more point. Each pulse in this high harmonic train is actually an independent mode-locked laser. It's an independent laser that is mode-locked at the fundamental round trip frequency. So those, those pulses don't actually talk to each other. They're, they're trapped in their potential well, uh, but the one next door, doesn't, they don't talk to each other. They're kind of independent. It's a weird sort of mode locking. <laughs> um, this means that each pulse can be independently manipulated. And for example, we, we came in with an, another pulse and we erased one of the pulses in the train and the laser kept, kept, uh, kept functioning. We erased a pattern of pulses and the laser kept functioning. So they really are independent. This is my next point is, what would happen if we arranged things so that the pulses could talk to each other? So there was coupling between neighboring pulses in the laser. So this would be, and here's a picture of this, so these would be the pulses, high harmonic mode lock pulses, and these are the potential wells at each position. And <coughs> if we had some mechanism by which the pulses could be coupled to each other, then we could use a Flocke analysis um, to, to work out the Flocke states that would form in this, this structure. And to do that, you would say, uh, uh, say there was a jitter in the pulse position here, Jn of the nth pulse, um, and the jitter in the neighboring pulse would be related to that by the block phase here, this e to the i phi b. So we do a standard nearest neighbor coupling analysis. It's, it's a laser cavity, so the round trip, the total, when the laser, when the pulses go round one round trip and come back, uh, it, the phase has to add up to a multiple of 2 pi. Um, and uh, you can then do the standard analysis and work out the Flocke states. And what you find is that you'd expect the pulses, if they're coupled to each other, to do something like this. So we would, we would get a, a Flocke state where, the, where you get a kind of uh, a wave traveling along at a different velocity from the velocity of the light. This is relative time here. You can see there's something moving along here. Um, you'd expect to see that. So why am I telling you this? Well, I'm telling you this because we did an experiment in which we, we, we observed this. And the experiment was done by a PhD student, uh, this guy Ye here. Um, he did it by including three photonic crystal fibers with different resonant frequencies in the core in the laser. Uh, and he, here are the, this is the optoacoustic gain of each, of each fiber. So these are the three gain bands. And the fibers are, very carefully made, tapered, and we use some a heating element to, to, to kind of fine tune things. They were tuned so that the frequency spacing between these, these resonance was, was the same, so at about 54 megahertz. And this corresponded to the 174th, 179th, and 184th harmonic of the, of the round trip time um, in, in the laser itself. And by doing this, we were able to introduce that coupling I was talking about. Um, but you could say, how can a pulse train simultaneously drive three resonances? Because if you want all these fibers to be driven by a pulse train, you've got to have some more frequencies in the system. Well, the answer is, if the pulse timing is periodically modulated, exactly as I showed you in the previous slide. Um, so we demonstrated this in the lab. So here is the, the these are the three gain peaks of the three fibers. We're starting with initially a single resonance state, so this is just, uh, the, 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 there's no pulse jitter. This is the pulse jitter as a function of time, it's not changing. And now what we did in the experiment was to change the EDFA power to switch to a state where we had all three fibers um, uh, 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 resonating or oscillating in the core. So from initial state A, over a huge length of time, 1.5 seconds, compared to gigahertz, this is, this is what we saw. We saw that the, <coughs> the timing jitter of the pulses gradually grew until it looked like this. And if you actually look at, at, at the, it's from different pulse numbers, 49, 58, 67, and so on, if you look at, if you plot that out as a function of pulse number, you get this periodic wave, which is exactly what I, is, is exactly a Flocke state. So what we've done here is to observe a Flocke state in the laser um, for the first time using optomechanical synchronization is what we're seeing. 
It's incredibly stable. I mean, it has to be very stable to observe this. This is 1.5 seconds. All the other frequencies are very, very high. So just to summarize this, there's an animation of this laser in operation. So the tiny modulated pulse train has Fourier frequency components that drive all three core resonances. These core resonances act back on the pulse train, locking it into synchronization. We can use Floquet theory. Uh, it requires that the block phase difference between each jittering pulse adds up to a multiple of two pi over one Ryan trip. Um, and the weak coupling that we have between the pulses is creates, it causes a, a slowly oscillating timing jitter. And the extremely high system stability we have, it makes it possible to see this very slow oscillation. Who knows what the potential applications are, but it was a huge amount of fun sorting out the science of what was going on there. Okay, this is my last topic um, of recent results. Um, and to introduce this, I'm going to talk a little bit about holocore. There's been, as I say, a huge amount of exciting work on, particularly on this type of structure, which I like to call a single ring anti-resonant reflecting fiber. The first group to make that fiber was in Moscow, and it was Dianov, who sadly passed away, and I think in 2021, not long ago. Um, he was the head of the group there. He called it a revolver fiber. because <laughs> um, It looks just like a revolver barrel, I guess, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, okay, so why, why is hollow core fiber so exciting? Um, so I'm aware I'm stepping back from the science for a moment to explain why we were so excited by these hollow core fibers. I sort of briefly mentioned it. Uh, earlier on. Um, these ho the reason why holo hollow core fibers are exciting is that long distance tight focusing is impossible in vacuum. I mean, you can use nonlinear effects maybe, self-channeling of light, but it's all quite complicated. Um, so let's just look at the Rayleigh resolution limit. Beam of light comes in, you focus it down to a spot. Everybody knows this in the room. If you don't, you should. <laughs> the spot size and the depth of focus scale with each other. If you make the spot smaller, the depth of focus gets smaller. There's no way you can keep light tightly focused over long distances. And in steps holocore PCF, uh, <coughs> which actually works. You know, we can actually make very low loss holocore photonic crystal fiber, not like some other structures that are very high loss. These are very low loss. Uh, we can keep the light tightly focused over essentially infinite distances compared to the focus of a lens. Um, and the very best fibers, the product of intensity and length in a structure like this is about maybe 10 million, maybe even more these days, greater than a focused laser beam. So what did we do with this back at the University of Bath? Well, I was lucky enough to have Feta Ben Abid as a postdoc working with Jonathan Knight on this, and I managed to persuade him. It took, it took quite a bit of effort, I seem to remember, to get him in the lab, fill the fiber with hydrogen, and do the experiment. But he did, eventually, and he's a brilliant experimentalist. So he, fi he filled the, the fiber like this with hydrogen, and uh, he observed very low threshold stimulated Raman scattering. And uh, at, uh, when this was published, it came along with a perspective written by Mike Downer. Uh, this is a quote from him saying, a new era in the nonlinear optics of gases and maybe even plasmas is about to begin. I think he was quite right. So there has been a whole lot of uh, uh, really very nice results coming out of uh, using, using, doing nonlinear optics in gases and these kind of structures. So let me just talk a little bit about um, the hollow core fiber itself and why it's interesting. Again, this is extremely simple, but it's a very useful way. I use it all the time for thinking about these fibers. If you make a hollow waveguide, <clears throat> uh, it's, it's always true that the guided modes in a hollow waveguide will have anomalous dispersion. That's to say the bluer, the higher frequencies travel faster. This is, a, this is because of the geometrical dispersion that the hollow waveguide gives you. It's a geometrical effect. If you think about a bulk material, it can have any kind of dispersion. Let's suppose it has normal dispersion, in which case it, the bluer light travels more slowly. Um, let's suppose we put those together. So we have an empty structure that has anomalous dispersion. We have some bulk material that has normal dispersion. Clearly, the dispersion you end up with here will depend on the geometry and on the material you put in the core. And if the material in the core is a gas, if you change the pressure of the gas, change the density of the gas, you can change the dispersion. So 
This, this was the first example ever of an optical fiber where you could, by turning a knob in the lab, you could radically change its dispersion landscape. And that, in essence, just in one sentence, is the reason this is so exciting um, uh, as an experimental object. Uh, okay, so let's just have a look at this. So this is one of our single ring fibers. <clears throat> it gives you long, well-controlled path lengths. You get a nice mode, believe it or not, a very nice mode guided in the core here. It gives you broadband guidance, which you need if you want to work with very short pulses. It has a very low light glass overlap. In fact, this is the anti-resonant reflection condition. It gives you a very low light glass overlap, so you have a very high damage threshold. But, as I say, the key, the golden key, the the, the wonderful aspect of these structures is that you can, you can change the dispersion by just simply changing the pressure. So here are some examples of calculations over this enormous frequency range, 200 nanometers to 900 nanometers. We, if, the, if the core is empty, there's nothing in the core, it has anomalous dispersion. And if um, we add some argon in this case, we can radically change the whole dispersion landscape and create a pressure tunable zero dispersion point. This is the key thing about my next topic, is this pressure tunable zero dispersion point. Because I'd, I'd like now, um, in my final topic, to talk about um, how you can use stimulated Raman scattering to do quantum state up conversion. Um, and I like to think of this as imposing molecular order the molecules are, are sort of randomly banging into each other and maybe they're in excited state, maybe not, but the whole thing is totally random, it's thermalized, um, you can't do much with it. But if you could impose molecular order, like this lady here, um, you could do some nice things. So let's just think about this. So why, <coughs> if you could do that, well that's what, let me, let me start first of all by talking about dispersion. So. If we imagine we're going to do some stimulated Raman scattering in hydrogen and we operate close to a zero dispersion point, which would be here, that's the point where the curvature of the, 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 the where the curvature changes sign. <clears throat> okay, this is frequency and, and, and wave vector. Um, and I remind you that this point is pressure tunable, so we can fine tune the, the dispersion profile to, to achieve whatever result we want here. Let's suppose we uh, pump the system with uh, with a frequency up here, and we turn up the power until we get stimulated Raman scattering, and what happens is that we'll create a Stokes band, a lower frequency band. Um, we'll also, uh, the, and the, the, the frequency of this band, of course, is less than the pump frequency by the Raman frequency, but you'll also create a delta beta, a coherence wave vector here, um, and this is, this is then a coherence wave, so it has a certain delta beta and a certain frequency difference. Um, so this is the coherence, so the, the, the wavefront velo velocity of this coherence wave, you can calculate it very easily, and it's just equal to the mean group velocity of, of the light. In other words, more or less the slope of this curve up here. So let's suppose we created that coherence wave. Let's view that coherence wave as a kind of hologram. Okay, it's moving, it's moving very fast, it's moving at the speed of light, but it's periodic, it looks like a hologram, you can diffract light, you can diffract light off it. Let's suppose we take that coherence wave and, and transpose it down to the other side of the branch. Oh, by the way, that's just a picture of a coherence wave. So the molecules themselves don't move anywhere, they stay where they are, but the, the, the vibrations are, are timed so that you get, you get a coherence wave traveling along, and matching the, the, the beat pattern of the light. Okay, so this is what I mean. Anyway, we create the coherence wave then we can read the we can read out this nonlinear hologram at a totally different wavelength, maybe down here, for example. We send light here, and if we choose these points correctly, so that this this these two lines have the same slope and the same spacing, then we can we can convert light from this frequency to a higher frequency with potentially very high efficiency. In fact, it's it's a linear process. It's no longer a nonlinear process in this case. We've created a refractive index, a moving refractive index distribution, that's a refractive index wave, and clearly you can use that to scatter light off it. You get a Doppler shift, Doppler upshift in this case, you get something like Bragg diffraction, uh, but it's essentially a linear process. It works extremely well. 
Um, this is an experiment from 2015 on this. So uh, this is a system where we uh, hydrogen filled uh, fiber. We wrote the we sent in pulses at 532 nanometers. We created uh, Stokes and uh, first Stokes and second Stokes signals. And then this was the signal we wanted to upshift in frequency. And this is the upshifted signal. So you can see the, the whole bandwidth is, is reproduced here. The shapes are really almost exactly the same. And the efficiency of conversion was ab above 70%. So it is really a very, very efficient process uh, and, uh, and, and very high um, fidelity in, in, in the, in the up-conversion process. So this is the, one of the most recent results from, from the people in my former group. This has to do with noise-free frequency conversion of quantum states. Um, and what we did was to use one of these hydrogen-filled single-ring holocore fibers. Here's a picture of one. These are simulations of the mode profile at different, at different wavelengths. All these wavelengths are, are relevant to the experiment. Um, uh, if we look at how the dispersion curve changes with pressure, so this is essentially that S-shaped curve I showed you a little while ago with a slightly different axis to make it easier to see the, to see the shape. So 80 atmospheres of hydrogen, 70 atmospheres, 60 atmospheres, um, and uh, the frequencies here are very important because uh, anyway, you, by tuning the pressure, you can actually at 70 atmospheres, you can achieve this phase matching condition that we wanted. You can make these two lines, this dashed line and this full line, have exactly the same slope and the same length. I'm going to come back to the, what these wavelengths mean in, in just a moment. Okay, here's the experiment. But, uh, David Navoa actually was the senior author in this paper, and he, he led this project. So we first of all created some biphotons, and we did this, not surprisingly, <laughs> using some photonic crystal fiber, but this is one of these, we like to call this a Mercedes fiber, because <laughs> obvious reasons. There's a little core in the center here. And by pumping this, this fiber uh, with 1064 nanometer light, we could generate um, sidebands at 1425 nanometers, an idler, and at 849 uh, nanometers, a signal. These, these are biphotons. These are entangled photon pairs created in this fiber. Then what we did was to split these two signals using a dichroic beam splitter into the 1425 nanometer signal and the 849 nanometer signal. Okay, and then we introduced the hydrogen-filled photonic crystal fiber with its pressure very carefully uh, uh, tuned, um, uh, and we send, sent another pulse, 1064 nanometer pulse from the same laser into the system. This is then to create the coherence wave in the hydrogen, and with the, the coherence wave present, this design so that the 1425 signal is upshifted to, um, to 894. In, in the fiber. Okay, so the 1425 comes along, there's very high efficiency up conversion of even a single photon here. So it gets upshifted, so you have a single photon coming up here. So this biphoton, one of the photons just goes straight to the detectors up here, the time tagger. And the 1425 one, um, uh, it goes through the system, gets upshifted in frequency, and then we, we checked for the, uh, the whether, whether they were still correlated, these, 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 these photons. So it's a classic kind of quantum optics experiment, um, uh, okay, with superconducting single photon detectors and a time tagger, the usual kind of uh, system. And uh, of course it worked, I wouldn't be telling you about this, it worked very well. First of all, um, just showing you how by tuning the pressure, we were able to, to optimize the quantum um, efficiency of this conversion process up to 70% in this case, so very efficient. Um, and this is an example of what happens if you turn the pump off and on. So this is the 70% conversion, down 70% um, uh, conversion, uh, and this is the dark kind in this case. And then the final thing we did was to check the uh, second order correlation function, um, and we could see no difference between the second order correlations of the up upshifted photons and the original, one of the original biphotons um, w when you just compared the correlation plots of uh, both before up conversion and after up conversion. 
So why is this interesting? Well, it's, it's a way of hugely increasing the frequency of a single photon without losing its state, without, without keeping its coherence. So it's, we thought this could be potentially of interest in quantum optics given the huge interest in quantum effects at, at the moment. Okay, so just one last slide. Um, <laughs> there's been a lot of people, a huge number of people who contributed to this work in, in my group over the years. These are pictures of, of the team, We're often with a lot of guests. You may notice, uh, you probably notice some faces here. I think probably that guy, for example, some of you may recognize. Um, these are groups uh, in Erlangen and in Bath of, o over the years, and um, it's not just not even just them, it's all the other people around the world that have worked on this. It's, there's, a massive, there's a massive number of groups working on photonic crystal fibers and, and the applications, and I'm very grateful to them all for taking the idea seriously and pushing it forward. So, and thank you again for the invitation to be here in this. Is you have any questions? To get that high efficiency, yes. um, well, it would be the fiber length. Uh, it's, it's, it's really not very long. I mean, it's less than a meter in length uh, in the fiber itself, um, and it depends on the strength of the coherence wave, of course. I mean, if you can excite more molecules of the hydrogen, and then the if, then the um, efficiency would go up even higher than 70 percent. But what they did in the lab was simply just optimize things um, using the equations because the equations are quite simple to solve in this case. Um, yeah. That helps. Okay. It's a resonant process. It, it's a resonant process, exactly. It's yeah. With the resonant problem, the chemical conversion, the fiber or the. The overall conversion. Yes, yes. I mean. You could say, what's the, what's the probability that a photon will get upconverted? You send a single photon in, what's the probability it gets upconverted? Well, it's 70%. Including the losses. Yeah, yeah, including everything, yeah. I mean, the losses, the linear losses in these holocaust fiber systems is typically close to zero. I mean, it's so small you can't measure it. It's so small you can't measure it. Um, so you can kind of forget about it. Um, yeah. You know, the institute, we have one of these so soft that microphones that you can throw. Maybe this room would be too big for that, I don't know. <laughs> well, th thanks for this great talk. Um, when you mentioned a uh, you know, state-preserving uh, photon. Now, of course, you probably should qualify that since we cannot clone a photon. So, in a sense, what is preserved? What is exactly the quantity which is preserved in the state of that photon? Um, I, I'm going to turn that back on you. I'm not a quantum optics ex expert. I worked with quantum optics people, um, <laughs> um, and they, I guess they, they, the, the system they used, which you would know more about than I do, is this, this oh, yeah, that's it's horrible. Sorry, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to switch it off, but. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I mean, this is the system they used in the experiment. Does that help? And if you want more detail, <laughs> if, if you want more details on it, I mean, I can't do everything. I'm, I'm not, I, yeah, I, I'm not part of the quantum optics community, really. But uh, but if you if you if you have a you know, I, I'll relay your question to people who know. So sometimes you have to confess when you don't know don't know something. <laughs> well, I can answer it. Sure. Oh, please. Yeah. So I'm a quantum optics specialist, ah, <laughs> so I can try to, to answer the question. What they, they, they did demonstrate actually is that when you have this uh, photon which is upshifted by the nonlinear optical process, you demonstrate, switch please, oh, sorry, yeah. you demonstrate that uh, beyond the conversion efficiency that the two photons remain by pair by measuring the second order uh, correlation function. The next step if I can uh, permit myself, would be to demonstrate that entanglement is preserved. So here, at the moment, there is no demo, uh, measurement of, an, of entanglement before the upshifting, and then would be done after the upshifting to, to make it clear that it is preserved during the process. Okay. Very good, thank you. There is a question there? Yes, okay. I thought 
Bonjour, je peux faire la question en français si ça ne vous dérange pas <rire> pour tout le monde. Euh, merci beaucoup pour le talk, euh, merci pour la présentation, c'était très bien. Donc oui, vous avez pas des fibres microstructurées dans lesquelles il y a de l'air, dans lesquelles vous aviez du gaz, etc. Est-ce que vous avez essayé, vous ou quelqu'un d'autre, des fibres dans lesquelles on aurait pu mettre pas, du liquide, euh, des matériaux différents, euh, je ne sais pas, de, de semi-conducteurs, des verres différents dopés, euh, je, je, voilà, toutes sortes de matériaux pour faire des interactions particulières euh, dans ces fibres-là Est-ce qu'il y a des choses intéressantes qui ont qui sont, uh, qui parlé de ça no, C'est une très bonne question, et beaucoup de groupes ont mis différents matériaux dans les fibres de fibres. Beaucoup de groupes ont mis des liquides dans looked at nonlinear effects, looked at uh, biomedical sensing, spectroscopy. Yes, I mean, you can put all kinds of things in the fiber. Uh, so it's hollow. The beauty is that it's empty, so you can put anything you want in. We, we have also put small particles in and guided them using uh, laser tweezer effects in, in the hollow core. It's also an interesting area. But, but yes, I mean, there's, there's still a lot to do. So if you want to do some research in the future, maybe that's a good choice of project. <laughs> I keep recognizing these faces, so. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Philippe, for this nice talk. Is it possible to make a polarization maintain anti-resonant fiber? It seems that there is not so many examples. So, um, so what, what, are, what are the difficulties and how making a polarization maintain affects then the loss of the fib fiber, if, yeah, if there is a relation. Yeah, no, I, I understand. Now, when you say polarization maintaining, you mean linear polarization states, yes, presumably. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, linear polarization states, because the core tends to be very large, it's, it's relatively difficult using geometrical distortions to get high amounts of linear um, birefringence. Uh, but if you operate, and I didn't talk about this in the talk, but we have these, these anti-crossings between resonant states in the cladding in the glass and the hollow core. If you operate in the vicinity of those states, you could create quite strong linear birefringence, but over a restricted wavelength range. Now, in the, in the, uh, but but the, 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 uh, uh, one particular thing that we can do very well is preserve circular polarization states in hollow core fiber. <coughs> by, exactly, by making a chiral, I didn't talk about this today, but we can, we can make chiral fibers by spinning the preform during the draw. And uh, those hollow core fibers preserve circular polarization state very well. In fact, you can even design them so that they have strong circular dichroism. So in, in practice, they only guide left circularly polarized light or maybe right circularly polarized light. So I say, well, one of the areas I'm most excited about at the moment are chiral fibers, and all the things you can do with them. Partly because the physics is diffi difficult. <laughs> It's not too easy to analyze a chiral structure. You have to think in a very weird way. You have to think in a twisted way, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Um, w what is the importance of the imperfections in this fiber, and how long can you make such fibers? What's the importance of, of the imperfections? The of imperfections. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, that's... Uh, Well, they're, they're very important. If you have imperfections and they're highly localized, um, that will cause scattering. And it's a very bad, very bad news. And that's the reason we draw the fibers in a very good clean room. So we, we, keep, we keep the dust away. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if, they, if other types of perfections maybe involve the preform, we make the preform, it's not perfect. Uh, but when you draw it to fiber, Because it starts out, say, a length of a meter or so and ends up as, as maybe five kilometers long, you smooth out any, any longitudinal imperfections that are slow. So, so basically, it doesn't matter. And what happens is the light is able to accommodate any slight changes in the structure as it propagates along. Um, but, but yes, if, if there are abrupt changes in the structure, then you get scattering and you lose guidance you know, clearly. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I understand that the, the properties of the fiber come, come from, the mic, from its microstructure. So my question is, do you think it would be possible to obtain similar effects at short distances if we used planar multilayer waveguides that should be specifically designed to engineer 
the same refractive index, similar refractive it's the same dispersion of the refractive index. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I think you could, yes, in a two-dimensional structure, um, which is multi-layer. No reason why, why you couldn't, shouldn't be able to create the dispersion you want. Um, but of course, it will diffract in the plane, if it's planar. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the, 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 difference, the difference between structures that are made using planar technology and the optical fibers is the vast difference in the transmission loss between fibers and planar, and we all know that's the case. So if you're going to work with a planar structure, you want whatever it is to, <laughs> to happen over a short distance nonlinear effect or, or something else. I mean, it, it has to happen over a few centimeters, maybe that kind of typical length. You, you'd be unable to make a planar structure that was five meters long or 10 meters long or even longer than that, uh, and, uh, which you can easily do with, with optical fibers. So, so I, although, although a lot of these dispersion effects and the hollow core guidance and so on could be done in a planar geometry, you would not be able to achieve the same low loss and maybe in that case it doesn't matter so much anyway because the device is not so long, you know, because you can't make a 10 meter long planar structure very easily. So it's, it's yeah, it's, it's a complicated question to answer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Philip. Great, great talk. Uh, and my question is, I come back to Thierry's question about imperfections. The, in the case of single ring fiber, there is no periodicity that accommodates uh, imperfection yeah. much better than one single ring. What, is, what are the limitations for this single ring fiber? What are the limitations for single ring? Uh, I'd love to have given a talk just about that fiber <laughs> structure because there's been so much work on it. Uh, the most exciting result was at OSC this year. Uh, Southampton have been working very hard at reducing the loss, and they've now achieved a loss at 1.55 microns that is less than the loss of the best, I'm not going to believe this, of the best SMF, the best solid core fibers. Oh. So, so it's on the cards that hollow core fiber may end up being used in long haul communications. Um, and this, this again is it's a slightly more complicated version of the single ring fiber. Okay. They actually have a nested, they have a, it's the, each, each capillary is slightly more complicated structure. I believe it's kind of incipient Bragg reflection that they're creating something like that by making the structure more complex. But the losses they've been achieving are, are basically right. stunning. I mean, it's been going down very fast. I mean, mm. Feta Benabit has got very low loss also. Mm. A lot of other groups have uh, as well. It's not something that I have been concentrating on in my group because I'm more interested in the scientific applications. And you don't need huge lengths of fiber in that case. Mm. But it's a very exciting moment in, in telecoms, I think. Mm. Who knows? In a few years' time, Thanks. maybe hollow core fibers will, will be being used by serious engineers, not mm. just people like me. <laughs> Thanks, Philip. Okay. Il est déjà temps de faire cette session.